Thanks in advance for taking the time to watch this brief. Whether your intent is to increase your awareness on the impacts of this ever-evolving Army manning environment on infantry officers in your formation, or to inform yourself on the process and methodology infantry branch will employ for your next assignment. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Jason Condry, and I am your infantry branch chief in the Officer Personal Management Division and Human Resources Command at Fort Knox, Kentucky. The purpose of this brief is to provide another method to engage our officers and their leaders across the globe to improve understanding of the science and the art that affects how the Army develops, promotes, and assigns infantry officers. Despite continuous efforts to meet with our officers and their leaders during Bullock, Captain's Career Course, ILE, PCC, and visits to units at their home station, as well as the phone calls, emails with officers and their leaders, our engagement and education strategy does not reach all of our officers, or perhaps more importantly, does not reach them at a time when advice would prove beneficial. If offering this brief extends our reach just a little further and prompts a leader or an infantry officer to reach out and engage an assignment officer about future opportunities, then we have achieved our purpose. When we meet with our officers in the field, many don't know what questions to ask or where to begin the conversation. What you see on the screen is a collection of the most common questions that we receive over the phone, via email, or during our visits to the field. In the absence of a live audience, with questions tailored to their experiences and gaps in understanding, I'll take about 35 minutes and attempt to answer these questions. I'll begin with an explanation of what HRC is, what it does, who represents your equities and those of the infantry branch from a human resources perspective. I will then discuss the general guidance from the Department of the Army, HRC Commander, and the Infantry Commandant that provides the left and right limits for your infantry branch team. Next, I will lay out the science of force management to provide an understanding of the laws, regulations, and policies that drive the career development of infantry officers and the process we use to distribute officers to meet Army requirements across the Army and joint enterprises. An understanding of the science will set the stage for the art that is required for talent management, where we combine individual implications to inform and drive the process to place the right officer into the right assignment. From there, we will discuss promotion and command, how OERs affect an officer selection for promotion, command, and competitive assignments, the board process, and a few other hot topics of interest to many across the force. Human Resources Command is one of several one-of-a-kind commands across the Army enterprise, purpose-built to manage Army-wide personnel programs and services for officer and enlisted soldiers of all components. HRC is commanded by Major General Jason Evans and reports directly to the Army G1, Lieutenant General Thomas Siemens. Within HRC, there are four operating directorates. TAG-D is responsible for organizing and executing our Army-wide human resources policies, programs, services, and systems. The services include personnel records, casualty and mortuary affairs, evals and promotions, postal, soldier program management, soldier transitions, and physical disability management. EPMD manages our enlisted populations using different systems and processes that are very different from how officers are managed and assigned. Persense D provides the organizational support for HRC and supports two main missions. Provide the human resources IT mission systems to manage the infrastructure and data that serve as your digital records and to support the accessions of individuals into the officer and enlisted ranks of the Army. In the not too distant future, DFAS Rome will move to HRC with all of its pay and entitlements functions as part of the Integrated Personnel and Pay System for the Army, IPSA. OPMD is led by Brigadier General Doug Stitt, an AG officer that began his career as an armor officer. His deputy, Mr. Martino, is a former Devarty commander and is one of the many civilians that provide stability and historical context for the division. Within OPMD, there are seven assignment divisions that house the assignment officers and branch chiefs for every branch and functional area. Infantry Branch is in Operations Division, led by Colonel Locke, with Armor, FA, Engineer, Aviation, MP, ADA, and Chem branches. While we compete across all divisions for promotion, competition for command occurs primarily among officers within Ops Division. Operational Readiness Division, led by Colonel Riley, serves as a check on the assignment divisions translating CSA and Department of the Army manning guidance into validated requirements across the Army and Joint Enterprise that are based upon branch or functional area and unit strengths. They manage the personnel accounts for every unit and serve as the voice and advocate for those units in the management and distribution of officers. The other division that consistently impacts the careers of infantry officers is the Leadership Development Division, led by Ms. Baxter, a retired MP Colonel and former Branch Chief. LDD's scope ranges from professional military education to functional training 
and scholastic broadening and advanced civil schooling to branch transfers, retirements, and separations. Your assignment officer will serve as your access point and advocate with LDD. The last thing I want to highlight is a coordinating relationship that Infantry Branch has with the Infantry Commandant, Brigadier General David Hodney. Under his guidance, we represent the equities of Infantry Branch and its officers to the HRCCG and OPMD Director. Here is your Infantry Branch team. It serves almost 7,000 active duty Infantry officers from the rank of Lieutenant to Colonel. We have 11 officers, two that serve in Alexandria, Virginia in Senior Leader Division to manage our Colonel population and two civilians, the Branch XO and Second Lieutenant Assignment Officer and Technician. Rarely do the officers you see here serve at HRC for more than two years. To facilitate relationships with the field, we attempt to keep officers aligned with the same cohort of officers throughout their tour to provide a consistent face and name for you to engage. While the names and faces will change, the phone numbers will not. So when in doubt, pick up the phone. Your assignment officer operates under the following standing guidance. First, as we visit units and posts across the Army, we have found that there is no difference between the saw gunner that stumbles toward an assembly area after an airborne or air assault and the saw gunner that stumbles out of the back of a Bradley or striker. With that saw gunner in mind, your AO is tasked to focus first on providing our soldiers with experts in combined arms maneuver who adapt quickly and thrive in any formation. Second, your assignment officer must be an expert in the laws, regulations, and policies and their associated exceptions that drive our management of the force and combine that information with the art of talent management to place the right officer in the right requirement at the right time. And finally, your assignment officer will proactively and responsibly educate and inform our officers and their chains of command so that they can see themselves in comparison to their peers and understand how to manage their careers in the near and over the long term. There's some additional considerations that affect the truth as we know it and guide the way Infantry Branch does business. Our officers must understand that the terrain changes over time and sometimes abruptly. The Army may be downsizing today and growing tomorrow. New force structure or a new threat may change priorities, so today's truth may not be tomorrow's truth. We will be prepared to offer the why behind a change in direction. The Army waits its main effort with personnel, funding, and other critical resources. Even if the Army has the luxury of directing only one main effort, providing personnel in support of that effort has implication across the Army as organizations that would have otherwise received infantry officers will now do with less or even without. We recognize that the most visible example of success is your battalion or BCT commander. However, changing Army priorities, growth or reduction of the force and force structure changes may mean that the path that your boss took to success is not available to you. We will work to ensure that your boss is also aware that the terrain has changed so that his counsel is more targeted toward the opportunities that you could be afforded. Acknowledging that personnel is consistently a critical resource, we must strike a balance between initiating movement of our officers to meet the need and not getting ahead of senior leader decisions. We don't sit on boards, nor can we predict the results. We study the files of our officers competing for promotion and selection to command before the board and analyze the results afterwards to try and understand what may have informed the board members' vote. There will always be anomalies that we cannot explain, but this effort allows us to offer historical trends designed to shape the advice we and commanders offer to our infantry officers. Infantry Branch does not create policy or regulations. We offer recommendations to commanders with our best effort to identify the associated risk. The enforcement of KD time horizons and the vehicular imperative are two examples of proponent and army policy that shapes how we identify officers for possible movement and place them in their next assignment. Only exceptional circumstances allow us to deviate from those policies and the decision authority does not rest with your assignment officer. In order to produce the necessary future senior leaders and the best CSL selected battalion and above commanders, we must build officers with a broad base of experience and expertise across all formation types to ensure we can deploy, decisively fight and win against any adversary, anytime and anywhere as a member of the joint force and with our allies and partners. Once an officer is a demonstrated expert, he or she will then go create more experts in the institutional army or share that expertise with our joint interagency and international teammates. Finally, it's important to understand that the field selects for the next rank and command based upon your performance, not where you served, nor the type of organization. There are no dead-end jobs or organizations. This slide represents our best attempt to capture the career of an infantry officer on one slide. 
At the top, we have the doctrinal template for a career in the infantry that includes years of service, boards and promotion timelines, KD and broadening windows overlaid on professional military education, and the decision points represented by purple stars that will drive future service and opportunities. All promotion, CSL timelines, and PME requirements are driven by statute and policy. No two officers will have the same path to reach their definition of success. Decision points. Decision point one is that first platoon leader OER that will determine your potential for junior officer broadening assignments such as the 75th Ranger Regiment or the Old Guard. The second DP is when officers have served their initial commitment. Will they remain in the infantry, depart the Army, or change to another branch or functional area? DPs three, four, and five are very similar. It's when that officer receives that first KD OER as a captain in command, as a major in field grade assignments, and then as a battalion commander. That first report provides an assessment of an officer's potential for promotion, competitive assignments, and selection for command. The operational, self-development, and broadening lines of effort depict the leadership, staff, and developmental education and assignments that allow infantry officers to successfully operate in infantry-specific branch and material and gym assignments. Central to an infantry officer's development are those assignments that build excellence in leading, training, and motivating soldiers, as well as expertise in warfighting skills, technical proficiency, and a well-developed understanding of combined arms, joint, and coalition warfare. Any discussion about broadening begins with whether an officer has demonstrated expertise in combined arms maneuver and warfighting at his or her current grade. Once an officer has demonstrated that he or she is an expert in the operational realm, we will seek to leverage that expertise to make other experts in the training base or share that expertise with our service, sister service, government, and coalition partners. Any discussion about broadening begins with whether an officer has demonstrated expertise in combined arms maneuver and warfighting at his or her current grade. Once an officer has demonstrated that he or she is an expert in the operational realm, we will seek to leverage that expertise to make other experts in the training base or share that expertise with our sister service, government, and coalition partners. DA PAM 600-3 defines success as reaching the rank of lieutenant colonel and serving 20 years. I have yet to find an infantry officer that defines success in the same manner. However, considering this question informs how you approach the assignments process and future opportunities. A consistent topic of conversation with officers begins with what is broadening. At the top, you see the chief's definition of broadening. From an infantry branch perspective, we see broadening occurring within the operating force by serving on a staff. When we look to broaden an infantry officer outside of the operating force, the officer's level of expertise and potential, as described by the senior raider, will shape where in the Army or joint enterprise they will conduct their broadening. In no way does this slide depict all of the units or organizations where we assign infantry officers. Instead, it's intended to shape expectations of where officers are needed to support Army requirements. Approximately 10% of our officers will compete and be selected for scholastic broadening opportunities. The remaining officers will be split between operational and institutional broadening assignments. Joint opportunities are highlighted in bold. However, not all assignments in these formations are JDAL positions. We will now talk the assignments process. In order to have your voice heard with respect to you or your subordinates next assignment, you must understand the process the Army uses to identify and distribute officers to positions across all Army formations, all the while synchronizing readiness requirements, reorganization efforts, senior leader priorities, and officer professional development. This is the science behind what we do, and fully understanding how and when you participate in this process is vital. 90% of our officers move within our two six-month assignment cycles. At any given time, Infantry Branch is closing out the previous cycle, executing the current cycle, and planning the next. The April to September summer cycle is when the bulk of our officers move. The winter cycle covers October to March. Though there are fewer assignment vacancies, there is no difference in the quality of those assignments in the winter. Each cycle will take on average of six months to develop. Because of this, we must know your intentions potentially 12 months in advance of a move in order to effectively and efficiently plan the cycle with your follow-on duty assignment. Along the top, you see the five stages to the distribution cycle process. Identifying officers to move, OIMs, prioritizing assignments, validating and building requisitions, aligning requisitions with an officer, and then releasing RFOs. Each of the numbers in the overall cycle diagram corresponds with a specific event in each of the cycles. 
The process requires participation by the officer, his or her unit and chain of command, an infantry branch, and is depicted in numerical order. The legend at the bottom signifies who has responsibility step by step of the process. Blue is infantry branch, orange is you the officer, and green is your unit. First step. Identifying officers to move is the first step to this process. Your assignment officer will have done an initial assessment based upon when you arrived at your duty station and, if applicable, when you entered your KD position. At this point, we are contacting you via mass email to accurately identify our officers who are moving. Not responding to this email should be viewed as missing the first opportunity to shape what is next along your career path. Silence does not equal staying at your current duty station. Establishing the number of officers available to move as accurately as possible is critical to identifying how many assignments will be created in subsequent steps. For captains and majors serving in KD assignments, the key to being identified as a mover is informing your assignment officer when you've assumed command or duties as the S3 or XO. Once they have received that correspondence from you, we will place you in a specific distribution cycle that aligns with your change of command date. That's 18 months in one command or 24 months for two commands. For, and for majors, we are looking at the same time horizon. No less than 18 months up to 24, including your time spent as a brigade level field grade. The next step is identifying and prioritizing all vacancies down to the brigade or equivalent level. This is primarily accomplished through the Mission Essential Requirements, or MER, using the Army Manning Guidance. The MER allows unit commanders to provide prioritized Mission Essential Personnel Requirements. It is critical unit commanders prioritize their requirements to ensure HRC understands that commander's manning priorities. Once the MERS are received back at HRC, unit vacancies and current strengths are analyzed against Active Component Manning Guidance, ACMG. Active Component Manning Guidance tells HRC how to fill a unit given projected overall strength and strength by rank. Once the analysis is complete, a list of unit vacancies across the Army are prioritized from 1 to X based upon the needs of the Army. Your assignment officer will also use the MER to validate you as a loss to that unit. Following the prioritization of assignments, assignment officers will declare you as an Army asset. It's at this point, depicted by the red star on the timeline, which is early April for winter movers and early October for officers moving the next summer, that you are now Army property and will fill a prioritized requirement. Efforts to remain at your current duty station will require significant chain of command involvement in many cases with general officer to general officer engagement to determine whether the justification to remain on station outweighs the impact of the mission of the command that will not have its vacancy filled. Assignment validation. HRC has already analyzed Army requirements and has identified the available population to fill the Army requirements. In looking at the previous steps in the process, if we have identified 200 major vacancies across the Army in step two and have an available population of 100 majors, HRC can only validate 100 of the 200 vacancies and will validate the top 100 in the prioritized list of requirements. Without exception, the available population will fall short of the number of requirements. The remaining 100 vacancies will go unvalidated until additional officers available to move are identified. At this point, we have 100 validated requirements that are proved to be built as an assignment that an assignment officer must fill. Your assignment officer cannot fill a lower priority requirement until those assignments are filled. Based upon the outcome of the assignment validation, your assignment officer will build a marketplace within the AIM to allow both you and units with validated vacancies to voice their preferences. Ideally, this is the second time you've had an opportunity to discuss your next assignment with your assignment officer. Once the marketplace closes and we have received officer and unit preferences, your assignment officer will align officers against valid requirements using your professional development needs the type of officer a unit requires, your preference, and other personal family considerations to guide slating. Once the assignment officer has aligned you to an assignment, the RFO will be created and released. Most RFOs will be released before the first month of the assignment cycle. However, there will be some that require specific coordination that may take longer to process. If you do not have your RFO within 90 days of your proposed report date, contact your assignment officer. In all, the process is iterative. And timely communication with you and your chain of command is critical to ensure we're able to balance your needs with mission requirements. To further illustrate how ACMG drives assignment prioritization, you can see that unit are placed within three categories, and separate from that category are directed fill positions. 
For FDA officers, that means that OCT positions at the CTCs must be filled. It also explains why you continue to receive orders to pull your best NCOs to go serve as drill sergeants. Currently, SFABs and Korea and Japan units and headquarters will be manned no less than 100%. All operating force BCTs and higher echelon headquarters are planned at 95%, not to fall below 90%. When you consider that 5 to 10% of assigned personnel in most units are non-deployable, many BCTs will deploy with 85 to 90% of their authorized strength. The Institutional Army represents the third and lowest category, and most often the organizations that do not receive validations for their non-directed fill vacancies. The days of Excel preference sheets sent via email are gone. AIM-2 was fully implemented for officers that moved during the 2018 summer cycle. AIM-2 is the face of the Army's talent management platform where you can see the assignments that are available to you and preference those assignments. Similarly, units with validated vacancies can see and preference officers that are interested in coming to their organization. To account for some of the organizations across the Army and Joint Enterprise where unique skills and experiences are necessary, there is a method to inform the assignment process. The back of the orb now has fields where officers can detail their skills and experience that may not be adequately depicted on the front of the ORB. This can be found on the My Resume tab. As an example, the front side of the orb will show that an officer is a 3-3 Chinese speaker, but that notation fails to highlight that proficiency includes native-born proficiency in three Chinese dialects. AIM-2 is also where our captains, majors, and lieutenant colonels will volunteer for SFAB and submit their necessary documentation. The inbox is another improvement offered by AIM-2, where your communication with your assignment officer and HRC will be captured and retained in one place and conversations are not subject to a good handoff from one assignment officer to the next. A current limitation in AIM-2 is that commanders cannot see what assignments are being offered to an officer, making that call to infantry branch that much more important. AIM-2 continues to receive updates and improvements based upon feedback from the field and assignment officers. You will continue to see this improve in the future. Thus far, I've focused primarily on the science of what infantry branch does for our officers and commands in the field. Beyond the legal and regulatory guidance that steers promotions and professional education, the assignments process, and how senior leaders prioritize which vacancies are filled, the more complicated art of aligning the right officer against the right requirement begins with a horizontal perspective of an officer's career in comparison to his or her peers. As officers, we are accustomed to viewing ourselves vertically within our organization. Number X of X lieutenants in the battalion, number X of X company commanders or majors in the BCT, and number X of X battalion commanders in the division and so on. Seeing yourself becomes difficult, especially when you consider the fact that the officer holding that number one company command report is among at least 32 other captains that receive the same report. Not to mention the 10 captains within your cohort serving as aides de camp for commanding generals who report state that they are the best captains in the division. That captain is among the top 40 or so officers if you only consider that one report. Your assignment officer can view your entire body of work and give you a more comprehensive assessment that allows to see yourself in comparison to those with whom you will compete for scholastic broadening, opportunities, promotion, and selection to command. Your assignment officer can view your entire body of work and give you a more comprehensive assessment that allows you to see yourself in comparison to those with whom you will compete for scholastic broadening opportunities, promotion, and selection to command. Since informal feedback from selection board members is that with five evaluations, they can gather enough information about an officer's potential to cast a vote, your assignment officer will look at your last four to five reports and let you know how you stand against your peers for whom he has done a similar assessment. Regardless of whether an officer is in the top 10% or bottom 10% of his cohort, the guiding principle in selecting an officer in their follow-on assignment is to place an officer where he or she will improve their chances for selection to the next grade or command. That principle may generate a disconnect between an officer's preferences, but if the discussion with your assignment officer is focused on a combination of immediate and longer-term goals, then a focus on the ends may make a previous undesirable post look much more attractive. There are many factors that bear an assignment. The only ones that don't are those that are not communicated to your assignment officer in time for consideration. Your assignment officer needs to know if you have begun an adoption process that will not be complete when you are scheduled to come out of KD, or that an additional six months on the station would mean that you do not move to your next duty station unaccompanied because your spouse is finishing an advanced degree, 
or that you're in the process of a divorce and custody of your children has not been determined. Unless declared a dependent restricted assignment, we will not send you somewhere where your family cannot receive the necessary medical or developmental care. We will consider equity in terms of deployments, both previous and those scheduled for a unit with a vacancy. If you have already served overseas, that is a consideration for an OCONUS assignment. If you have already served in the training base or generating force, we will look to leverage your expertise by broadening you in another aspect of the Army or Joint Enterprise. Or we will choose to place you in a similar role, but at a different level of responsibility. We would avoid sending you back to the same location. Infantry officers will generally receive their orders after their peers in other branches. This is simply a function of scale. There are more infantry officers moving each summer and winter than in other branches and placing the right officer in the right requirement simply takes longer. The start point for the discussion about your next assignment begins with an understanding of your goals, an assessment of your file, and whether you have met the proponent and developmental requirements. From there, we will discuss how your next assignment can meet the Army's requirements, improve your chances for selection, yet still meet your personal and professional goals over the long term. I'm sharing where we sent captains and majors coming out of KD the summer of 2018 to help shape expectations about the demand for infantry officers and what that may mean for future assignment cycles. In the last year, the Army has grown three and a half BCTs worth of force structure that almost exclusively consumes KD complete officers. Over the next year to 18 months, that will increase to five and a half BCTs of force structure as SFABs four and five come online. This has occurred without a corresponding increase in the size of the operating force that produces KD Complete Infantry Officers. As we redirected KD Complete Officers to fill these new requirements, that caused a dramatic increase in the number of officers that leave the schoolhouse and fill broadening vacancies that were previously filled by KD Complete Officers of the same rank. The additional force structure and prioritization of those requirements mean that remaining on station after KD completion will only occur when exceptional circumstances apply. Within a given year group, across all branches, there are more than 4,150 officers commissioned as second lieutenants. 98% will promote to first lieutenant, and 81% will reach captain. 55%, or almost 2,300, will reach the rank of major. Of those majors, 684 will be selected to attend resident CGSE. 35% of that cohort will reach lieutenant colonel. It's approximately 1,450 officers with 130 of those selected for CSL and 98 of those selected for Senior Service College. 581 of that original 4150 lieutenants, 14% will reach Colonel, and only 37, plus or minus three, will be promoted to General Officer, less than 1%. With only a few exceptions, empty branch exceeds the Army averages for promotions, even if rates adjust up or down in comparison to a previous year. While we publish more detailed analysis with the release of the results of each promotion board, here are some general trends that we anticipate will remain unchanged in the near future. Currently, the Army is growing, so that means that unless an officer has derogatory information in their file, or a senior rater has used senior rater comments to directly communicate to the board not to promote an officer, selection to captain is almost guaranteed. Similarly, if an officer is not selected in their AZ look to major or lieutenant colonel, they will likely be offered CELCON, or Selective Continuation, for a period of three years, during which they will continue to be considered for promotion each year. Promotion beyond captain will depend heavily on success in KD position. If an officer does not receive at least one most qualified KD report, he or she will be at risk for promotion. As a general trend, officers with three MQ reports out of the last five evaluations, with at least one of those in a KD position, are promoted to the next rank. Though we publish the statistics on advanced degrees and ranger qualification, we do not see where a master's degree or ranger tab will save an officer that failed to perform in the critical job at that rank. As you would expect, selection for command requires a much higher quality of officer as reflected by senior rater comments on evaluations. The exceptions are the officers that did not receive all most qualified reports since graduating ILE. The time spent in KD positions in warfighting units is in line with the approved guidance published by the infantry commandant. Your assignment officer will offer candid feedback on your potential for promotion or selection for command. We have focused heavily on OERs. That is because they are the primary tool we use to determine if an officer should advance. The primary audience for your senior rater's comments is the board member, 
However, word choice or the absence of language and enumeration should be discussed during senior writer counseling. In addition to the box check, where most qualified reports are limited to 49% of the total population of rated officers at that rank, your senior rater crafts a word picture made up of four elements of potential. Enumeration. The best evaluations have clear numerical enumeration as the lead sentence in senior rater comments. Number one of XX. Schooling potential. Important for captains and above since ILE and SSC are competitive selections. For lieutenants, the captain's career course is an assignment, so an omission is less egregious. After ILE, all major reports should describe potential for SSC ranging from select, must select, and select immediately after battalion command. Promotion potential. Senior raters communicate this with varying levels of emphasis. BZ, ahead of peers, promote now, promote with peers. This language is all intended to distinguish different levels of potential. And then command potential. Varying levels of emphasis to describe command potential. Will, must, ready, groom, those are all words used to to determine different variations. Senior raters should avoid mentioning potential for VTIP to another branch as that might serve as a discriminator should the officer choose another path. Given the time available for a board member to review and vote on each file, less is more in the senior rater comments box. Two lines and no more than four are all that is needed to communicate if an officer should be selected. This is a tool developed from a combination of formal and informal feedback from leaders that sat as members of a promotion selection board. We have shared this in a recent Infantry Branch newsletter article titled OERs, A Candid Discussion Amongst Professionals. While the block check that distinguishes a most qualified officer from a highly qualified officer is the starting point, the enumeration and word choice further serve to distinguish levels of potential. OERs using strong enumeration instead of percentages appear to strengthen an officer's file. A most qualified report with number one of 75 carries more weight than a top 1% officer. Similarly, a most qualified report of number five of 30 majors will carry more weight than a top 10% officer. There also appears to be a shift to using single enumeration. Number one of 36 instead of multiple enumeration. Number one of six battalion S3s, number five of 30 majors within the BCT, and a top 5% officer. Clear enumeration sends a stronger message to a board and leaves less room for guessing when it comes time to vote. There is an expectation that second time commander will be more seasoned and have more demonstrated potential for selection to major than the newest staff captain on the staff. Some senior rater philosophies will characterize officers with respect to their peers by pooling officers. As an example, captains, number X of X staff captains, number X of X officers, number X of X company commanders, number X of X, captains, I senior rate. Potential for promotion, command at the next level, and schooling, must or immediate select continues to be the strongest language to describe potential for promotion and selection to command and SSE. The focus for these comments should be the next rank, level of PME, or command. For captain evals, since ILE is mandatory requirement for all officers selected to major, the selection for resident, or school of another nation or sister service shows exclusivity for a high performer. As a general observation, infantry officers do not understand how they are selected for promotion and command. This is a snapshot of the major promotion board. In the bottom left corner is a link to a mock board OPD that is invaluable to explain the board process and how to best prepare your file. For the annual majors promotion selection board, the board is comprised of 17 members and presided over by a major general. The remaining members are current or past CSL selected officers that represent diversity across the Army, not only with, with respect to race and gender, but also branch and functional area. On the Majors Board, there will only be one infantry or armor officer. Note the board guidance from the Secretary of the Army. This rarely deviates from the central premise of selecting the highest quality officers with the skills and capabilities needed now and in the future. In the Majors Board, board members will view as many as 1,500 files. They will randomly receive a file and spend two to five minutes, with the average being closer to two minutes, before casting a vote from one to six plus or minus, with one meaning that a show cause board must be initiated. Board members have two screens. The first thing they will see is your DA photo next to your ORB. Your photo is your handshake with the board member, who is generally looking to see if you are fit. 
They will spend a few seconds on the orb, noting deployment info, awards, and general assignment information. A current photo and clear and accurate assignment history can seal or break the deal in the first few seconds. Ask yourself, can an Army veterinarian understand where and in what positions you have served? Every board member develops their own strategy to form their initial assessment and criteria for how they will score your evaluations. Next, the board member will review your first performance document, your most recent OER, and can look at every report or certificate present in your file. They will generally move through your evaluations until they come to an AAR, but they can continue to look to other evaluations if they do not have enough information to cast their vote on your file. The senior rater block checks and comments are the most influential aspects of a board member's process to determine if you should be selected for the next rank or command. Performance, not the type of job or duty location, trumps all. If there is any derogatory information, a board member must review that before casting a vote and moving to the next file. The combined scores from the 17 members will be used to generate an OML. That OML will then be filtered against any branch or functional area requirements to determine the list of selects. We'll now go into a few hot topics that we get consistently from the field. The first is VTIP. The VTIP program is designed to allow officers to transfer out of their basic branch to a functional area or a different branch with a lower strength for that year group. These panels are held twice a year by LDD during the first and third quarters. Since eligibility is a function of branch and functional area strength and the desired skills, such as professional military education or command at the captain level, varies based upon the Army's requirements for that functional area, each panel is preceded by a MILPER that defines the standards for applicants. These functional areas and branches support maneuver, so we do not discourage infantry officers from competing for selection into a functional area or an understrength basic branch. That officer understands combined arms maneuver and the warfighting culture making him or her a better member of a future staff. We do want to know as early as possible if an officer wants to transfer into another branch or function area, so that if command is a prerequisite, we can place them in the most advantageous location to generate the reports necessary to get them selected. The days of sending an underperforming infantry officer to a functional area are long gone, with selection being very competitive due to 20 or more applicants for a single vacancy. The next VTIP panel will occur in November, Look for the next MILPER and talk to your assignment officer if you're interested in the program. Acknowledging the need for flexibility in the provision of forces in support of any future contingency operation, the CSA directed the creation of five active security force assistance brigades, or SFABs, designed for the train, advise, and assist mission. Specifically organized, specially equipped, and trained for the train, advise, and assist mission, each SFAB will be comprised of approximately 520 personnel, 110 of which are officers. For SFABs 1 through 3, infantry officers filled approximately 40% of the officer positions, ranging from brigade and battalion commanders, S3, XO, company commanders, to brigade and battalion primary staff positions. SFAB is a nominative assignment, almost exclusively requiring KD complete officers who are highly competitive for promotion and future command selection, have operational deployment experience, are medically deployable, and physically fit. All battalion and brigade commanders are second-time commanders, and roughly 85% of the captains and majors positions in the SFAB will have successfully completed their KD requirements. Captains, majors, and lieutenant colonels with 18 months of KD time in their respective rank will be considered for the SFAB. The prioritization of SFAB will have implications on the number of officers available for institutional, operational, and academic broadening opportunities that would otherwise have attracted this caliber of experienced infantry officer. The life cycle of each SFAB has yet to be determined, but officers should expect assignments that range from two to three years. At this time, SFAB is a 100% volunteer organization. Officers can volunteer for the SFAB via the AIM-2 portal. We receive lots of questions about joint qualification. Infantry Branch owns 22 validated hard-coded 11 Alpha JDAL positions, spread between the ranks of Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel, and Major. Officers will occupy these positions for 22 months in one day if they're departing for command SSC up to 36 months. In any given year, two assignment cycles, approximately six to eight of these positions will come available. We compete with other branches for branch immaterial JDAL positions, presuming we have enough officers to fill all hard-coded and direct fill requirements. As of April 18, the Department of Defense modified the requirements for joint qualification, the three alpha 
skill identifier. Joint experience points change to 24 points. A minimum of 18 of those points must come from joint experience in an assignment. The intensity multiplier of three for downrange deployments has been adjusted to two. So therefore a nine month deployment could generate 18 points for joint experience. Officers can receive a maximum of six discretionary points for participation in any joint exercise listed on the Joint Staff J7's approved exercise list. Officers will now receive joint tour credit for two years of service down from three. However, unless departing for SSC or command, officers will still serve for three years in that joint position. Your performance of duties in a joint position or participation in a joint exercise must be captured in OERs, awards, and or orders to enable you to submit those experiences for joint credit. I hope we have met the purpose of this brief and answered many of the questions that caused you to spend valuable time with us. Every day I spend in this job, I learn something that would have been useful 10, 15, and even 20 years ago. I expect that this brief has created some questions that are specific to you or the circumstances of your officers. I recommend you go back to slide four and engage myself or an assignment officer to fill any gaps that remain. Throughout a career of service, an officer will experience continuous change in assignment officers, assignment opportunities, and mentor advice that guide their career path. The only constant will be the officer. Our goal is to enable that officer to be aware of his or her potential in the eyes of the Army and the opportunities that potential represents. Thanks for your time.